Rarely in history has an academic been as intellectually vindicated as our guest. And with that, it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor John Mearsheimer back to CIS. Hi there, John. Hello, Tom. I'm glad to be back. Well, John, in the current edition of Foreign Affairs magazine, that's the November, December 2021 edition, it's titled The Inevitable Rivalry, America, China and the Tragedy of Great Power Politics. You make a provocative thesis. Summarise succinctly your argument. Basically, the article deals with how the United States dealt with China during the unipolar moment from the time the Cold War ended up until President Trump took office in January 2017. And my basic argument is that in the last decade of the Cold War, it made eminently good sense for the United States to ally itself with China and to help China grow economically, because that would make China more powerful and it would allow China to be a good ally uh, for purposes of balancing against the Soviet Union. When the Cold War ended, in 1989, the question on the table was, how should the United States think about dealing with China? And the fact is that China was a very poor country in 1989, uh, but it had a huge population advantage over the United States. And therefore, there was a real danger if we helped China grow economically given its population advantage, if it became rich, if it became prosperous with all those people, it would be a threat to the United States. In effect, it would be a peer competitor. What happened over the course of the 90s and really the first 20 years uh, of this new century is that the United States foolishly pursued a policy of engagement which was designed to make China richer to make it wealthier. Just very important to understand that we mm. help China, we, the United States, and of course the Australians, the Japanese and so forth and so on, went along with us. We made China into a powerful country in East Asia. And China is now at a point where it is determined to dominate all of Asia to become a regional hegemon. The United States, of course, and the Australians are bent on preventing China from dominating Asia for good strategic reasons. But the end result of all this is that we're effectively in a new Cold War. Okay, so succinctly summarise, your argument is that once China grew wealthy as a result of Western engagement, particularly US engagement in the 1990s and the 2000s, that a US-China great power competition was inevitable. That's exactly right, Tom. And the fact is, as you well know, in the early 1990s, most people thought that realism was dead or that balance of power politics was dead. Great power war was off the table forever. And that people like me were dinosaurs. Mm. So when I made the argument uh, loudly and clearly starting in early 2001, uh, that we were in trouble and we should do we, what we can to slow down. Very important to understand that in 1990, China was a backward country economically. It had 175th the per capita GNP of the United States. And per capita GNP is a really good indicator of just how wealthy a country is. So this was a backward country but it was deeply committed to growing economically, to becoming prosperous. So the question is, what should the United States do? A good realist like me would say that it's obvious that what the United States should do is do everything possible to slow down Chinese economic growth. And here we're talking about the fact that China depended on US uh, markets, US technology, and US capability to grow. And with regard to those markets, we should have gone to great lengths uh, to slow down trade with China, to not give them any special deals, which we did do. We certainly should have not welcomed them in to the WTO. And as far as technology is concerned, we should have gone to great lengths to prevent technology transfers to China. And we should have gone to great lengths to limit uh, foreign direct investment in China. 
And we did none of those things. And in fact, we did the opposite. And the result is we're now in deep trouble, you say, and there is little we can do to change the situation. Tell us more. Look, the fact is, Tom, from Beijing's point of view, it makes eminently good sense to want to dominate Asia, just the way the United States dominates the Western Hemisphere. The Chinese have no interest in having the Americans in their backyard any more than we, the United States, have an interest in having China in our backyard. That's why we have the Monroe Doctrine. Mm. So once you take a country with that larger population and you make it really wealthy, it is going to have the wherewithal to take efforts or to take measures to try to dominate its region of the world. And of course, the United States is going to try to prevent that. So what we did was we created a situation where China was powerful enough or is powerful enough to try to dominate Asia. You make the what did the widespread rejection of everything you've been saying of strategic realism, what did the widespread rejection of realism tell us about Western public discourse during the 1990s and the 2000s? I think there are two points here. Uh, the first is I, I think that the Frank Fukuyama view of the world won out uh, once the Cold War ended. Uh, people in the West believe that the United States and its allies had fought fascism in the first half of the 20th century and defeated it. And then in the second half, we mainly in the West here, and this would include countries like Japan and Australia as part of the West, I'm using that term loosely, uh, that we had defeated communism. And that what the future held in store was nothing but liberal democracy. As time mm. went by, more and more countries would become liberal democracies. To put it in slightly different terms, we had the wind at our back. Mm. And people like me who argued that realism was still alive, great power politics would still matter in the future, were seen uh, as dinosaurs, people who had an outdated view of international politics. So the fact is, Tom, there was absolutely no chance, given um, how people were thinking at the time, that we could sell an argument that it made sense to slow down Chinese economic growth. And in fact, most people believe that if China grew economically, it would eventually become a liberal democracy. And because liberal democracies don't uh, engage in violations of human rights, and because liberal democracies don't fight each other, well, first of all, with regard to China, it would have delayed for a long time, the point at which China became a great power. Remember, during the Cold War, China was not a great power. We lived in a bipolar world. There were two great powers on the planet, the United States and the Soviet Union. So China was not a great power in 1990. It would have taken much longer than it has for China to become a great power. And furthermore, I believe once it became a great power, let's say that happened in 2025 or 2030, that great power would have been much weaker than the one that we're facing today. So we could have slowed down Chinese economic growth and delayed its achievement of great power status. OK, now your point is that the United States and Australia and Japan would have suffered as a result of this. I think there is some truth in that. There is no doubt that we would not be as prosperous today as we are, but we would not have suffered as much as China did. And the relative power gap, which is of enormous importance, the relative power gap would have been much more favorable for the United States, for Australia, and for Japan. And that matters greatly. We would not have committed, Tom, we would not have created, Tom, a peer competitor. Why do you think this Cold War will test policymakers more than the last Cold War? John Mearsheimer. Yeah, there's no doubt, Tom, that your description of the Soviet Union is correct. And the United States did have its hands full 
dealing with the Soviet Union in the sense that it was physically located both in Europe and Asia and adjacent to the Gulf, as you say, and China's not. But that's not the most important dimension of the conflict. What makes the conflict between China and the United States more dangerous than the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union has to do with where the central focus of the competition was during the first Cold War and where it is during the second Cold War. During the first Cold War, Asia and the Gulf did not matter that much. The focus of US attention was on the central front in Europe. Most of Soviet military power was concentrated in Europe. Most of American military power was concentrated in Europe. That was the focal point. The focal point today is in East Asia, as you said, almost exclusively. And it involves places like Taiwan, the South China Sea, and the East China Sea. And my argument, Tom, is that during the Cold War, it was highly unlikely that we would have a war in Central Europe at that focal point, in large part because both sides had massive armies, massive amounts of tactical air, and were armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons. Therefore, it was difficult, almost impossible, to imagine those two military forces crashing into each other. So the Cold War, Cold War number one, was dangerous for mm. sure, but it was not that dangerous because the focal point, the central front, would have resulted in a conflict that was so horrible that it was hard to imagine getting it started to begin with. Now, let's move to East Asia today. Very different situation. There's no central front. The points of potential mm. conflict are places like the South China Sea, the East China Sea, where you have these rocks that the Japanese and the Chinese fight over, mm -hmm. and then Taiwan. Those are the three focal points in East Asia. Well, it's easy to imagine a war breaking out between the United States and China <clears throat> over those three pieces of real estate, mm. in large part because it would not involve a massive conflict involving large armies and thousands of nuclear weapons. This is why everybody today is talking about the danger of a war over Taiwan yeah. or, a dan or the danger of a war over the South China Sea. So this new Cold War is going to be more dangerous than the first Cold War, which is not to say it is axiomatic that this Cold War, the new one, will become a hot war. But I'm just saying I believe it's more likely than the first Cold War because of the geography, yeah. that they are in effect going to hit the flat of the curve, then you're right that that's going to make it almost impossible for China to dominate Asia. I hope that happens. I'm hoping that the Chinese economy hits the flat of the curve. The last thing I want to see is Chinese, the Chinese economy grow by five to six percent annually for the next two or three decades. That would not be good from an American or an Australian point of view. But I am not confident that China is going to hit the flat of the curve. The Chinese have done an impressive job of fostering economic growth yeah. for at least the last 30 years. And I see no reason to be confident that the scenario you describe will happen, while nevertheless hoping you're right. And we should. <laughs> I believe that even if you were a classical liberal, listen, just let's talk a second about Joe Biden. When Joe Biden got elected president, he had been a classical liberal. He had been a staunch proponent of engagement as head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and when he was vice president under uh, uh, Barack Obama. So he was a staunch liberal. What happened when Joe Biden replaced Donald Trump? Did he go back to those liberal policies 
or did he continue the more realist policies of Donald Trump? Mm -hmm, The answer is mm -hmm. he's followed in Trump's footsteps. So I think you, the liberal, Tom Switzer, if you were placed in charge in Beijing, you would behave largely the way Xi Jinping is behaving. Listen, in the West, this includes Australia and the United States, most commentators refuse to accept basic realist logic, and they end up defining the behavior of particular leaders in terms of their personality or their ideology. All sorts of people are going to argue that China is aggressive because Mm -hmm. it's not a democracy. It's not uh, like the United States. My argument is just look at how the United States has behaved. Okay, but let's... No, I, I, I think that all of the available evidence is that the United States is committed to upping the ante in East Asia. Just look at what's happening with regard to U.S.-Taiwanese relations. The United States is moving closer and closer to a firm commitment to defend Taiwan Mm -hmm. no matter what. Could you ask for better evidence that we are not going home? Furthermore, with regard to Afghanistan, A lot of Australians and a lot of people around the world say this is evidence that the United States has lost its will uh, to fight uh, uh, around the world, that it's, you know, going home. This is isolate. This is evidence of isolationist American play. This is ridiculous. Australians should be thrilled that the United States ended the war in Afghanistan, not only because it was a stupid war to begin with and it was a lost war, but also because it now frees us up to concentrate more resources on East Asia, more resources to contain in China, which is in Australia's interest. In your, mm, that's uh, my point. Yeah. That's right. You can make that case. But the fact is nobody is seriously arguing that the United States should adopt an isolationist policy, number one. And number two, what people should care about is not what the chattering classes are saying. Who cares what the chattering classes are saying? The question is, (laughs) what is the deep state doing? We just want to know, what is Joe Biden and company doing? And the answer is that Joe Biden and company, just like Donald Trump and company, are deeply committed to containing China. You know, I hear all this talk about Taiwan. People are saying, should we defend Taiwan or not? This is a meaningless debate. The train has left the Mm. station. We are defending Taiwan. We meaning the United States, period. End of story. The deep state has decided that. So, All this talk about isolationism and restraint in terms of dealing China is, to me, largely of interest to the chattering classes. Australia is free to align with China if it wants. Australia is free to sit on the sidelines if it wants. You're not giving up your sovereignty. What's happening here is Australians, or at least the deep state in Australia, has decided that it is in Australia's interest to align with the United States. That's why you're doing it. And it makes perfect sense. The United States has decided that it's in its interest to contain China. And I think if you go back to the Australian case and what Keating said, he's wrong when he says that Australia is abandoning its sovereignty or giving up its sovereignty. It's not. It's just made a particular choice. If you talk about the balance between submarines on the Chinese side and on the American side, it favors us decisively. The fact that we control Taiwan makes it remarkably difficult for China to project power beyond the first island chain, Afghanistan. We should have never gone to war uh, and engaged in regime change in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and we should have never entered the Vietnam War in 1965. However, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about great power competition. We're talking about the United States up against 
peer competitors. We're talking about the United States up against potential hegemons in places like Asia and Europe. And the United States has gone up against four potential peer competitors in the past, Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union. In, and in all four cases, the United States prevailed. We have a fundamentally different track record when it comes to great power politics than we do when it comes to intervening in developing countries and trying to do regime change. What we're doing with regard to China is not synonymous with what we did in Vietnam, Iraq, or Afghanistan, thank goodness. It's synonymous with what we did with the Soviet Union, Germany, and Japan. And there we have a good track record. This is not to say we will ultimately be successful in the decades ahead against China. Who knows how this one will play itself out? I would not bet against the United States. But our track record here is much better. Now, with regard to his last point, that this is a very dangerous situation and that he as an Australian is very disturbed by the idea that Australia is getting dragged into this security competition, this dangerous security competition between the United States and China, I don't blame him one bit. <laughs> if I were an Australian, I'd feel the same way. Yeah. But the question you have to ask yourself is, what is the alternative? Yeah, yeah. And the fact yeah, that... Would... Yeah, go on. No, go ahead. Well, I think if you look at the Quad, there are three Asian states that have basically made it clear that they're with the United States. They've chosen sides. That's Japan, uh, India, and Australia. So I, I think there is a certain element of truth in what you said. Uh those other countries, right, and this includes countries like South Korea, the Philippines, and Vietnam, which I believe will eventually uh, move decisively to the American uh, side, are trying to straddle the fence. And I don't blame them, right? You saw this with Australia for many years. The Australians did not want to be forced to pick sides. And it's completely understandable. So there are a number of countries, as you point out, that are straddling uh, the divide, and uh, eventually they will be forced to pick sides. There's no way the South Koreans and the Filipinos are not going to be forced to pick sides. And the Vietnamese, they're moving gingerly, as are the Singaporeans and others. But they understand that I believe they understand, I believe, that in the end, it's in their interest to side with the United States. And this is well, I'm not sure at the moment that we could win over the Russians. Uh, I think we made an egregious error in alienating uh, Russia in the first two decades of the 20th, 21st century. Uh, I, I think what's happened uh, is terrible because we have, in effect, we the Americans have in effect driven the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. It's a NATO expansion, all that, yep. Yes, it was NATO, it was, it was a combination of, of three factors, NATO expansion, EU expansion, mm -hmm. and the color revolutions. Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. threatened, we threatened the Russians in ways that angered them greatly, led to the war in Georgia in August of 2008, and then led to the ongoing crisis in Ukraine, which broke out in February 2014. Yeah, but the problem with my critics is they're not thinking in terms of balance of power logic. The fact is that Russia is not a potential hegemon in Europe or in Asia. Russia is a declining great power. It's not a threat to us, meaning the Americans, certainly the Australians, in any meaningful way. Well, it's a giant gas station that's holding Europe to ransom during this energy crisis. That may be true, but who cares? That is not strategically important for the United States. What we care about is whether or not Russia has the capability to dominate Asia the way China looks like it's going to have the capability to dominate Asia. That's the key issue on the table. We're not dealing with the Soviet Union here. We're dealing with Russia. And the fact is that relations between Russia and Europe 
and Russia and the United States are terrible today, in large part because of the West policy towards Russia, and especially American policy towards Russia. And your question is, can we turn this around? That China is a threat to India, and it's a, it's a threat to India up in the Himalayas. There's a huge border dispute between India and China that uh, is yet to be settled. And furthermore, China will eventually be a threat to India in the Indian Ocean because the Chinese are building a blue water navy that's designed to project power into the Persian Gulf. So the Indians are deeply concerned about China. And what we're trying to do with the creation of this notion of an Indo-Pacific theater is we're trying to tie East Asia and India together. And we want India to help as much as possible in East Asia. And of course, we want these countries in East Asia to help India as much as possible. And of course, the Americans are the critical actor here because they have the military capability to throw their weight around both in the Indian Ocean and in East Asia. But that's what's going on here. And just think about the Quad. Who are the four countries in the Quad? Australia, Japan, India, and the United mm -hmm. States. So you see very clearly how we're trying to sort of stitch together an alliance structure that includes not just East Asia, uh, but the uh, Indo part of the Indo-Pacific. Well, for Australians, you have a simple choice here. Uh, for economic reasons, for purposes of maintaining your prosperity, uh, it makes more sense uh, to side with the Chinese than with the Americans. Uh, but from a security point of view, uh, it makes eminently good sense for Australia to side with the United States. Uh, China is a threat to Australia. Uh, if China were to ever dominate Asia the way the United States dominates the Western Hemisphere, this would be terrible news for Australia. And I believe deep down, all Australians know that, right? So you have a choice here and mm. the choice is a rather simple one. And the choice has been made. You're going to ally with the United States. And as I said before, I think most countries in East Asia will do the same. Europe is in a fundamentally different situation. It goes back to your point, Tom, that China is not a threat in Europe and it is not at this point in time anyway, a threat in the Persian Gulf, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. China is a threat in East Asia and in the Indian region, right? That's where it is a threat now, in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, so the Europeans can afford not to worry about China as a military threat. And they can trade with China, right? They could think, that they could have their cake and eat it too. The Americans will provide security for them. NATO will remain intact and they can continue to trade with China. Whereas the Australians and the countries in East Asia are in a much more difficult okay. situation. So geography, geography explains the difference between Europe and Australia. I get that geography, the Europeans are much less dependent on the, uh, on the US for its protection than Australia. I just say the Europeans cozy up to Beijing on the economic front as they did late last year when they signed um, that commercial agreement with China. Um, and if the Europeans get even closer to China, how do you think the Americans will treat the Europeans who have been a long time strategic ally? Well, it will enrage the Americans. I mean, you're basically positing a scenario where uh, the Europeans uh, do things economically that will help China to grow economically more powerful. Feeding the beast. They'll feed the beast, that's right. And mm. I, I think that there is a reasonable possibility that some European countries, maybe many European countries, especially Germany, will feed the beast. And I think this will enrage the Americans. And then you have to ask yourself, Tom, what are the consequences for NATO? 
what are the consequences for transatlantic relations if that happens? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you want to understand if they do feed the beast and the beast continues to grow, the United States has then powerful incentives to move more resources out of Europe to East Asia mm -hmm. for purposes of containing that growing beast. Indeed, and let Sue asked the question, is China now developing a theology of exceptionalism to justify its bid for he hegemony, just as the United States betrays itself as a force for good in bringing freedom and democracy to the world? That is, it talks like a liberal and acts like a realist. Are we seeing the same dynamics at play in China? John? I think Sue's absolutely right that the Chinese are talking about themselves as if they are an exceptional country. But I would argue that this has a, a long-standing, uh, uh, this is a long-standing tradition in the Middle Kingdom, so to speak. The Chinese have always viewed themselves as having a superior culture. They view themselves as being exceptional, just like the Americans view themselves as being exceptional. And both countries are now playing that card and will continue to play that card. The big difference, however, is that the Americans have always been remarkably adroit when it comes to soft power and selling the American way of life, selling American culture abroad. Uh, the Chinese, on the other hand, and you see this with their wolf diplomacy, have mm -hmm. really done a terrible job mm -hmm. on the soft power front. And when I look at how the Chinese have dealt with Australia over the past few years, I really scratch my head and say, what are the Chinese thinking? They've purposely alienated Australians. They've made it very difficult for Australians to make the case that they should side with China over the United States with this wolf warrior diplomacy. So on the exceptionalism point, I think Sue's exactly right. But on the soft power side of things, which I think matters even more, the Americans have done much better over time, Donald Trump notwithstanding, at selling the American way of life at selling American culture abroad. This is the question, it goes like this. Should Australia have worn those wolf warrior uh, diplomacy threats and, um, and just uh, pay tribute to Beijing and accept the 12 demands uh, that the Chinese government made on our relationship um, and, and just withdraw from AUKUS? No, no. The, uh... The Australians did the right thing. It's, it, my view, as you know, Tom, has long been that it's in Australia's interest when security is a salient issue to side with the United States. Uh, I yeah. think there's no question, going back to Malcolm Fraser's rhetoric, that Australia has to be careful when you're dealing with the United States. The United States tends to be a rogue elephant. Great powers tend to be rogue elephants, the United States included. So Australia wants to go to great lengths to make sure that as it gets close to that rogue elephant, it doesn't end up in a situation where the rogue elephant rolls over on top of Australia and does great damage. Okay, question here from Alison though. Aren't China's strategic objectives limited to its near periphery, Taiwan, South China Sea, East China Sea, Xinjiang? This is her argument. Aren't you overstating China's capacity and intent to threaten the sovereignty of countries in like far away Australia? No, I think that what's going to happen here is that China is going to imitate the United States. It's very important to understand that I'm basically arguing here that China is operating according to balance of power logic, just the way the United mm. States did when it created hegemony in the Western Hemisphere. Australia, right? Australia is in East Asia, and the Chinese want to dominate East Asia. This is not to say they want to invade Australia and run its politics, right? But what they want to do is push the Americans out of East Asia, 
They want to be by far the most powerful in East Asia, and they want to have a say in Australian domestic politics, just the way the United States mm. has a say in the politics of every mm. country in the Western Hemisphere. Mm. It is not the case that every country in the Western Hemisphere can have its own foreign policy. If you decide that you're going to have your own foreign policy, you are going to pay a really serious price. And if you have any doubts about that, look at what's happened to Cuba since mm. roughly 1959, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. Castro affected a revolution in that. Country. Or indeed Venezuela in more recent times. Exactly. And yeah. that's, that's what Australia has to worry about. It's right. And furthermore, you want to remember that if China were to dominate East Asia militarily and there was no United States, let's assume the Americans went home, China over time would develop really formidable military forces that it could use to coerce countries like Japan, South Korea and Australia. Okay, another question. Anthony Carr, another longtime member of CIS. Thanks for tuning in, Anthony. He asks a cheeky question, but it's a good one, John. Put you on the spot here. If the deep state got it so wrong about China during the 1990s and the 2000s and 2010s, the high point of engagement, uh, can we expect the now discredited deep state to get China right in the future? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I have a one word answer to that. Hopefully. <laughs> well, your point's the structure and the system, isn't it? That's, that's the point. Yeah, yeah. Look, the truth is, Tom, as you and I have talked about before, during the unipolar moment, when the United States was super powerful, it was possible for American elites, American foreign policy elites, to have delusions about international politics. You could believe the kinds of ideas that Frank Fukuyama was purveying. You could do that because we were so powerful. However, that world has gone away. Yep. We are now in a very different world. We're in a multipolar world where there's one particular country out there, China, that is a peer competitor of the United States. And that is focusing the mind. Another question. I believe that insti inter international institutions um, are vital in maintaining a rules-based liberal international order. It's this system, John Mearsheimer, not the 19th century power politics that you talk about. It's the liberal international system that in the 21st century will provide a balancing mechanism to, to constrain state actors. So why can't a UN-led system keep in check a rising China? John. Well, I think that the problem with Kevin's comment is that he is trying to separate great power politics from rules and from norms. And what you want to remember is that we had rules and norms galore in the 20th century. We had many, many institutions in the 20th century, and institutions are basically rules. But the key point is, it's the great powers who write the rules. It's just very important to understand that. The United States loves rules because the United States gets to write the rules. What's going on with China today is China is trying to write new rules. And furthermore, what happens is that when the great powers don't like the rules, they violate the rules. So rules are inextricably bound up with great power politics. Now, Kevin talks about the United Nations. He talks about the United Nations like the United States has divisions of its own. He talks about the United Nations like there's this institution out there that has 20 armored division equivalents. Nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> the United Nations is comprised of the countries around the world, right, that have come together to form this institution. China and the United States are part of the UN, right? And so when you talk about the UN doing something, you're talking about China and the United States doing something. It's China and the United States who bring force 
to the UN. And the UN is not going to be able to do anything to contain China because it has no divisions. And because China is part of the UN.